they decided what they wanted to do was they wanted to look at meditators in their laboratory. So they put a little cannula in their arm um, and asked them to meditate. And when they reached that kind of peak experience, um, they were also put on a little strain. So at that point, radioactive tracer was injected into their blood. And so they could see the areas of the brain that were having high levels of activity at that time. What they found was that meditation involved an increase in activity in the frontal part of the lobe, uh, the frontal lobe, and it also involved a decrease in activity in the, in, in the parietal lobe. So what does this mean? Well, we know that meditation involves a refocusing of attention, and we also know that the frontal lobe is important in terms of attention. So we see this decrease, the, sorry, we see this increase in activity in the frontal part of the lobe that reflects this, uh, the brain cells that are just focusing attention and sustaining that attention over time. Now for many of us, we largely use our left brain because we're having, you know, we're having to work out our shopping list and, and, and juggle our uh, budgets and so on. Um, and because we know that attention is a right brain function, we know that meditation actually causes this switch from the left to the right hand side of the brain, so it gives us that access to those two different modes of thinking and perceiving. So what does the effect on the parietal cortex do? Well, what it does is it reduces activity in those brain cells that tell you where you are in, in space-time. So people who meditate, they have this, you, you, you know, they, they lose that sense of, of, of their self and their body and the outside noise, etc. And they experience this expansion of awareness. And so that comes from this dissolving of the self and non self boundary. We also know that the parietal cortex is important for language. And so that explains why uh, a lot of people say, you know, that it's, it's hard to describe the experiences that they've had during meditation. So, we know attention is important in consciousness. Um, we know that cognitive processing is important for consciousness. We know that memory is important for consciousness, as is sensory perception, all of the information that we're getting from the outside world. Um, our spatial awareness, where we are in, in this particular room, in, in, in this particular time, language, and then also this internal clock, so the, the thing that is saying that what I just said has come after what I just said before. So that now gives us an idea of some of the research, um, but what does that research tell us about the nature of uh, consciousness? And this is where, unfortunately, I don't have the answers. What we do know is that um, consciousness is able to interact with the external world. So I can have a thought, um, you know, and I can make something happen. We know that consciousness is a property of the living brain. So, you know, we don't have consciousness in our liver, or there isn't consciousness, or we at least we don't think there is consciousness in, in, in a dead brain. We know that consciousness is not the result of just a whole bunch of information processes working together. Because although the sci-fi movies might lead you to believe that in fact there is such a thing as artificial intelligence or, or, or self-awareness, unfortunately we're still a little bit far from, from, from that uh, sci-fi reality. We know that brain activity can be conscious or subconscious. So just the fact that the brain is active doesn't mean that we have consciousness. There's a lot of stuff that we're doing subconsciously. We also know our brain works in parallel, so we can do a lot of things at the same time in our brain, but actually our conscious mind is serial. So the whole idea of women being better at multitasking than men, complete fallacy. No one can multitask. Um, Interesting, learning 
requires consciousness. So you have to be consciously attending to what you do to learn something. But once you learn that, then it drops down into the subconscious mind and the recall um, occurs without you having to think about it. We know that consciousness is packaged in concepts. So, you, you, you know, this this is, um, you know, it's a, it's, it's a bottle of water, it's, it, it's, it's a container of water, it has, a, it has a label on it, and all of these things, are, you know, are brought together and unified into the concept of water bottle. And we know that consciousness is not just associated with brain activity, we know that consciousness is associated with synchronous brain activity throughout different parts of the brain. Now for many people, this has led them to believe that consciousness is like a field. So you have all these uh, functions going on in the brain, you have all this brain activity, and that some, somehow consciousness is like this energy field that interfaces with the brain. Now, the problem though is, what came first? So here we have new around these parts, stranger, and yet the question remains, who came first? So does the brain create the field? Or does the field somehow influence brain activity? And unfortunately, that is a question that science cannot answer. There's a couple of bits of research that I want to leave you with just to get you thinking. And the first is near-death experiences. Now this is very interesting. So a huge number of people have had near-death experiences. I think it's about one million people have reported it in the US alone. And during these experiences, even though the patient is essentially has no heart rate, has no brain activity, they, they, if they spontaneously revive, they can often recall things that were said in the operating room when they essentially had no brain activity. Or they report being aware of floating in their family home, watching their family, um, you, you know, sitting there um, and being upset about their illness. So I think it's interesting that here you have an example of even in the absence of brain wave activity for a period of time, there still is consciousness. And the other thing that I'd like to share with you is also um, some uh, work that has been done by Kel Wilbur, the very uh, well-renowned transpersonal psychologist, and I recommend you look at this video. He created um, a, a YouTube video, and what he uses is a mind mirror. A mind mirror is essentially that same kind of uh, EEG that records the electrical activity. And on this video, what he does is he shows his brainwave activity as he's talking to the camera, and then he settles down and he switches off his brain. And there's just no activity at all, apart from a little bit of delta waves there because he has the intention to share this experience with others. And then after about five minutes, it all, it, he all switches it back on. So somehow, he's able to consciously control his brainwave activity. So that gives you a, a few things to, to take home with and, and, and puzzle over. So I haven't any, question, any questions, but I think we're going to do that at the end. So thank you very much.
The second way the science can get around difficult issue or bony issues is to generate a jungle of jargon. And Daniel Dennett is the best example for generating a whole jargon, a whole jungle of jargon, and he gets lost in it. And he wants you to follow him and get lost as well. This is called academic acumen. <laughs> gymnastics, gymnastics, in order to waffle with a serious issue. Consciousness is a serious issue. It continues to puzzle serious scientists, neuroscientists, they're saying, Mr. Akani, this is the hard problem of science. What is this thing? Where does it come from? What is its nature? We have no clue. This is a real answer from a serious, sincere scientist, not an arrogant scientist. We could two kinds of scientists. Those who say they're sorting everything out, and those, you know, we were the, the, the Dawkins and the Hawkins of the world. And then we know those who become more humble. The more they discover, they become more humble by the discoveries. Like Niels Bohr or Einstein. So I mean in, 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 in the camp of the second kind of, you know, form of scientist, the more more you like the more mature, more humble scientist. Now I'm going to explore an area that is very close to my heart, that puzzled me when I was doing my first degree in physics. It still continues to puzzle me, but I think I'll sort it out now. And this issue is called quantum. As soon as you hear the word quantum, you always say, come on, Mr. We are stuck coming in now. Good stuff here. <laughs> We're going to them explore it. First of all, let me give you a warning. You see, the quantum phenomena, they said it's hard of modern physics. Look, let me first of all tidy up. We physicists are highly pretentious. We say to all other scientists, the biologists like Dawkins, and all the engineers, and all the scientists, and look, chaps, when it comes to the nitty gritty, when you want to come to the nature, when, when you wish to understand the nature of reality, the fabric of reality, you chaps have to sit at our feet and we'll sort you out. <laughs> we are the most pretentious of all sciences. We've got all the answers, whether it's going to be DNA, computer chips, whatever, come to us, we'll sort you out. <laughs> and this is an important thing, because you see, in days to come, this physics is going to trump the biologist in explaining what is consciousness. This is how, in fact, the answer of consciousness does not lie, according to me, in biology, but in physics, modern physics, the physical of most physical sciences, that which wishes to explore the very fabric that produces this universe in front of us. What is this all about? Now, you see, the serious scientists like Neil Bohr and Werner Heisenberg and Schrodinger, when they were exploring this quantum phenomena in the early 1920s, they were pulling their hair out. Einstein was struggling too. Let me crack with a humor. You see, this quantum phenomenon has got three fathers. Now, if you've got any child who's got three fathers, that child will be queer. <laughs> now, this quantum phenomenon is queer. When it was born, you know, the three fathers were amazed by this particular child. And this particular